I've been working on freshwater issues and conservation and restoration of rivers, um, the politics of water for a very long time. And so I'm really, really happy to join you today to talk a little bit about my favorite topic, which is how we can protect our rivers and wetlands and lakes and all the fresh water that supports life on the planet. Um, I think what I will do is talk for a while. Um, if something isn't clear and you can, you know, write your question um, that pertains to what I'm talking about, I'll try to answer it as I go along. But otherwise, it might be good if I talk for, for a while and do the presentation and then we uh, take your questions afterward. But if something's not clear, try to flag me and I'll, I'll try to clear it up right away, okay? Let me see if anybody's saying anything yet. Okay, hello to the Kenyan Middle School. Okay, thanks everybody for, for coming to the uh, webinar. Really, really appreciate it. So let's get started, okay? Um, and again, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. And so think of your questions and, and we'll make sure we leave time to get to them. Okay, let's see, here we go. So this is a picture that some of you may have seen. This is a picture that the um, astronauts of Apollo 8 took on their first manned mission to the moon. This was 50 years ago and it showed the Earth in this very kind of vulnerable state, you know, out in space. But it also showed, you know, how lucky we are to live on this blue planet, right? This really water-rich planet. Look how uh, kind of barren the moonscape looks below that, that picture of the Earth. So it really gave us a feeling for, you know, just how, how lucky we are. But one thing we know is that less than 1% of all that blue is actually fresh water that we can access to drink and to grow our crops and, and all those things. So a very, very tiny share of that water on the earth is, is fresh water. And so it's very, very important. The other thing is that you can kind of see this, right? The other thing is that it's finite. You know, we think of rain coming down all the time and you know, water just keeps coming and coming. But in fact, it's finite. That water cycle only makes a finite amount available. But as we all know, our use of water, our demands for water, are not finite. So I just put up a picture of a cotton shirt. Take a guess in your mind how much water it might take to make one cotton shirt. Just think about it in your mind. If you want to jot down a, you know, an idea, go ahead. But we're going we're gonna to give you the answer in just a second. But in your head, just think about how much water it might take to make a cotton shirt. OK, here we go. That's a pretty surprising amount, right? And the reason for that is that it takes a lot of water to grow the cotton out in the field. We'll see this in a minute. That Anything that, that is growing on the earth takes a lot of water. You have to transpire that water through the roots of the plant. It goes back to the atmosphere. Um, and, it, and it just takes a lot of water to grow that cotton. Even if you grow it efficiently, it takes a lot of water. So think about that number. That's, a, that's probably more water than you use at home in a week to, grow one, the, to, grow, to, to, to create one cotton shirt. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. How about this? Hopefully you've had some lunch. Imagine a, a delicious margarita pizza with tomato and cheese and basil. That can take as much as 330 gallons to make. Delicious, right? And we love it. But just to be aware that it takes a lot of water to make all the things we use and eat and buy every day, right? Just an awareness. It's not to say don't eat a pizza. Of course we love pizza but we don't want to waste the pizza, and we want to appreciate just how much water it takes to make all of these products. And if we multiply all those pizzas, all those shirts, all those computers, all of the food we eat, and the billions of people, right, 7.6 billion people on the planet now, we can start to understand why we have a situation around the world of growing water 
shortages, right? It used to be that we had enough water for everything, but we have so many more people, so many more meals and products that we have to produce, and it all takes water to make, okay? So here we go with a map of global water depletion, where we're seeing shortages around the world. When I first started working on water issues about 30 years ago, <clears throat> this map would have looked very different. There would have been a lot less red. We didn't have as much trouble with water shortage and water scarcity as we do now. But look at, for example, the Western United States. You can see that. Look at Asia. You can pinpoint India, China, the northern part of China in particular, much of Asia, Pakistan, North Africa. These are areas that are dealing with water shortage on somewhat of a regular basis and so have to really figure out how they're going to meet their future demands for water um, as, as, as those demands increase. But again, the supply is pretty finite. So keep that in mind. And we're beginning to see how this shortage looks on the ground. We can look, for example, <clears throat> at the Rio Grande. This is a river not too far from where I am right now. And this is not the end of the river. It's the middle of the river. Almost all the water is taken out of the river for irrigation of crops. OK, so miles and miles of it are often dry. And this is the second biggest river in the American Southwest. We've heard in recent days about Australia also being in drought. Well, this picture was taken a while ago, but this is their uh, biggest river in the southeastern part of the country, the Murray River. And it's a very, very important river for their agriculture, their economy, and it has looked like this at times, right? Completely dried up. And here's our lifeline in the American Southwest, the Colorado River. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about the Colorado and how we're beginning to restore it. So keep this picture in mind. The last, for the last 90 miles of the river, the river's in Mexico. And after that last dam at the border between the U.S. and Mexico, the river is dry. It's virtually all diverted out, again, for agriculture, for cities. You know, north of the border, this water goes to, to grow crops. Throughout the Southwest, it goes to supply Phoenix and Tucson, San Diego, Los Angeles. So virtually nothing is left um, for the river ecosystem itself. This is the delta that used to be a very, very lush wetland, a beautiful place for birds, and it's now completely dry. So keep these images in mind, OK? We're going to come back to the Colorado <clears throat> toward the end of the presentation. We also have to think about dams and what they do to rivers. So around the world, if you add them up, we have now constructed over 58,000 large dams. And these are dams that are you know, 45 feet high or higher, so pretty tall dams. We have many more small ones. The one you're looking at right here is the Hoover Dam on the Colorado River. This was the first super dam built in the 1930s, and it really began a whole big um, era of dam construction. You know, the engineering technology was proven um, with, with Hoover Dam. It created that, that lake behind it, which we call Lake Mead. And it stores a good bit of the Colorado River water. And you look around the world and add them up, 58,000 large dams. Now, these dams have produced a lot of benefit for us, OK? If you think about uh, what a dam and a reservoir are doing, can generate electricity, hydroelectricity, can store water for irrigation, for recreation, for, uh, for, for water supply for cities. It can control floods. You capture the flood and you store it behind the dam. So we've had a lot of benefits from, from dams. But from the point of view of the river, it's a very different ecosystem now. You've disrupted the flow of the river. And so what we've seen is a lot of change to the habitat. Uh, life within rivers is, is diminishing and that sort of thing. So, so we have to think about not only the benefits of dams, but also the costs and, and, what, and what we're paying in terms of effects on nature from the construction of the dam. A lot of us, I'm sure, that are watching today get water from underground 
get their drinking water from underground. And yet we see that in many places, many of those red places on the map that I showed at the beginning, many of those areas are taking more groundwater out than is being replenished or recharged. And so that's a real problem for having water in the future, right? In many places, it's, think of it like a bank account, right? If you deposit into the bank, you can then withdraw that much. But if you're withdrawing from the bank more than you have in there and more than you're uh, putting into your account, you're going to be depleting that supply right over the long term. You're going to be depleting your account. And that's what's happening with groundwater. So if you think about the global food supply, about 10% of it depends on depleting groundwater. So as I say here, we're, we're in some ways using tomorrow's water to meet today's demands for water, which is not sustainable, right? It raises a question about how are we going to meet that, that demand for water tomorrow if we're depleting it today. So this is a serious problem. And it's literally out of sight, out of mind, right? We just saw pictures of dry rivers, the Colorado, the Murray, the Rio Grande. So we can see that there's a problem. Groundwater is literally underground. And so we've been using satellites to try to help us understand what's happening underground. And it's telling us we've got a problem in China, in India, in the Western United States. And we have to reconcile um, our use of groundwater with, with the supply that's actually there. Okay. This was something I didn't think a lot about when I started writing my book, Replenish. But I learned that globally, soils can hold eight times more water than all the world's rivers combined at any point in time. But if you think about it, we haven't managed the soil very well. There's a picture on the left there of a healthy looking soil, a very thick, uh, dark soil with a lot of organic matter. But then look at the picture on the right, you know, the deep plowing of that of land with a tractor. Well, that's going to subject the soil to wind erosion, water erosion, and you're going to lose some of that healthy soil and the, and the quality of the soil will diminish. And we've seen this over and over again where the organic matter in the soil, the really rich stuff that allows you to grow healthy crops is diminishing over time. And that means that that soil cannot hold as much water. So when a drought comes along, a farmer's going to have less water in the soil to meet the crop's demands for water. And so we have to think about resilience, as particularly as we're seeing more drought, and how we can build that soil reservoir back up again, how we can make it healthy again. Another problem, and we're going to get to solutions in just a minute, but I'm trying to give you a feel for all these ways we've sort of broken this water cycle. So hang with me, and then we're going to get to some, some more positive examples and stories of solutions, OK? So here, I'm sure many of you know what a wetland is. We sometimes call it a swamp. Um, and they're very, very important because wetlands are really good at capturing flood water, holding that water, cleansing that water, the vegetation and microorganisms that are in wetlands naturally filter and cleanse the water, and they create great habitat for birds and, and fish and wildlife. Well, we've lost about half of them around the world. We've converted wetlands into farmland. We've converted wetlands into cities. We've drained them and put up shopping malls. I'm sure you've seen this in places where, where you live. So we've lost all those benefits. So when a big hurricane comes now, we don't have the wetlands to capture the water and hold the water and store it. Instead, it kind of runs quickly off the land, runs into uh, rivers quickly, and that kind of thing. So we're not getting that, that same benefit anymore. That part of the water cycle isn't, isn't there. And as I mentioned, we, we see freshwater life. You know, we're celebrating biodiversity this week with the, with the biodiversity teach-in. And this is, this is really important in freshwater. Uh, this is my colleague, Zeb Hogan. Some of you may have seen him on the National Geographic channel. Um, he works with what we call megafish, really big fishes. Uh, Zeb here is holding a female Mississippi paddlefish. This is a fish um, related to sturgeon, which had been around for hundreds of millions of years. But they're now at risk of, 
of going extinct because of all the, the dams and the pollution and the changes in their, in their habitat. And look at that statistic I have at the top of the slide. That since 1970, the average abundance of freshwater vertebrate populations has declined 83%. So, so over that time, over that 40 years, or close to 50 years, 50 years, close to 50 years, we've seen a dramatic drop in freshwater mammals, fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians. And that's really shaking up you know, the health of ecosystems, that we just have fewer species, not only fewer species, but fewer animals in general, right, that are keeping the whole system functioning. So this is, uh, this is a concern, too. I, I, sh I put in this slide because we have a lot of, in this country, a lot of diversity of this little creature called the freshwater mussel. And these little creatures um, are incredibly good at cleansing our water. A single mussel, you can see one here, a single mussel can filter as much as 15 gallons of water a day. That's what they do. They're filter feeders. So they take the water and filter it, you know, take it into their system, filter it, and then release it cleaner than it was before. So a little community um, of, of freshwater mussels is like a little water treatment plant working naturally in the river or in the lake. But we're seeing a lot of these populations decline and a lot of these species go extinct because of pollution, because of drying up of rivers and other you know, changes to their, to their habitat. OK, hang with me. We're going to have one more tough slide, and then we'll get to some solutions here. We hear a lot these days about climate change. And look at the long list there of ways in which the climate changing, the, clim the changing climate that we're seeing is going to impact water. If you think about it, most of the ways we experience climate change are through the water cycle. More droughts and floods, changes in river flows, glacial melting, lower water quality, warmer water, more dead zones from the increased pollution going into our lakes and rivers, new precipitation patterns, sea level rise. So all these things are, are happening as a result of this warming temperature, which you can see there in the chart on the, on, the, on the right side. So this says to us, as we think about water, that you know we can't assume that the future is going to look like the past, because it's not. In fact, the past is no longer a good, reliable guide to the present, much less to the future. And we've seen this over and over again with hurricanes intensity and drought intensity and, and all of these kinds of things. And so it says, really, that we have to think about a new way of solving our problems. Here is you know, the, the incredible physicist Albert Einstein. I love this, this statement that he made a long time ago, that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of, of thinking we used when we created them. We have to think differently. And when it comes to water, what does that mean? Well, think about it. We have been you know, kind of managing water in kind of a, what I would call sort of a command and control kind of way. There's a river. Let's build a dam. Let's take the water out of the river and bring it to the city, bring it to the farm. And again, we've gotten a lot of benefits out of that. But what we're seeing is we're at a tipping point now where the costs to nature and the ability to adapt to climate change is not going to be met by the, that same approach of working against nature, commanding and controlling nature. And what we're seeing is that by working with nature, using nature as a partner, right, working with nature rather than against na nature, we're able to think about a more resilient and secure water future and to build a more resilient and secure water future. And so that's what I want to talk about. I hope you've gotten sort of a picture of all these ways in which the water cycle is broken, but we can fix it. And I want to give you some examples of places that are fixing it, collaborations of people that are fixing it, and what you and I can do ourselves and in our communities, right, to, to be part of the solution here. So think about your own, let's, let's start by thinking about our own personal water footprint. 
Right, I mentioned at the beginning about the cotton shirt and the pizza and so on. And if you multiply by all the billions, well, we have, we have the water stressed picture that I showed you. But what about if we each were able to shrink our personal water footprint? And that doesn't mean living less happy lives. It, it, it simply means being smarter about how we understand our water footprint and, and thinking about ways we could imagine shrinking ours. Okay? And so that's really, I'm going to talk a little more about that, um, but making it smaller, living happy, healthy, productive lives, but using less water in the process. So how do we use water? If we're an average American living in this country, we're using about 2,000 gallons of water a day to keep our lifestyle going. Okay, And that takes into account what we eat, the energy we use, the clothes we're wearing, and all the things we buy, and also the water use at home. And take a look at that bottom 10%. That's the water we use at home. So we tend to think about, you know, not, you know, turning off the water when we brush our teeth. Oh, maybe we'll take a little shorter shower. And those are important things to do because that's our local water supply. That's our drinking water. But we can also think about the food we eat and how much water it takes to make it and making sure we don't waste water. You know, every time we throw out a cup of coffee, we're literally throwing out 37 gallons of water that it took to make that cup of coffee. The energy we use, maybe we can use our bicycles more, maybe we can carpool more, because every gallon of gas in the car takes 13 gallons of water to make. It takes water to fuel an airplane, water to fuel a car. So we can do this. It helps to turn off the lights when we're not using them. It helps to conserve energy because it takes water to make energy, whether it's at a coal-fired power plant or a hydroelectric facility, right? How about blue jeans? I'm wearing a pair right now. You can't see them. 2,900 gallons to make a pair of blue jeans. That's an incredible amount of water, right? So let's be careful how we use them. Let's think if we can you know, uh, wear them out a little bit longer, make sure we take care of them, not have to buy quite as many things. And again, I don't think it means being less happy, right? It means just being careful about the things we buy, the things we use, thinking about exchanging, thinking about recycling, recycling clothes, recycling paper can be really good things to reduce our footprint. So there's lots of ways we can do it. And it's kind of fun to think about in a way. You know, you could talk about it with friends. You know, how could we actually, you know, imagine shrinking our personal footprint by say 10%, 20%? And so it's a it's kind of an interesting Thing we can talk about. Also thinking about our communities and our homes and our society, there's lots of ways we can conserve water on farms, in factories that make these products for us, and also in our own homes. Okay, So if we go up one level from our personal footprint and think about how society uses water, how our community and home, homes use water, we get some other, we get some other ideas. As I've been saying, it's particularly important to think about agriculture because of all the water we take out of rivers and lakes and groundwater, 70% is used on farms to grow our food and to and and, and to and, and, and to you know create our food products. And so that's a very important part of this picture is figuring out how we can improve water use in agriculture. And I want to give you an example of a, of a project that I'm really fond of on a river in Arizona called the Verde, um, the program that I helped to start when I was at National Geographic uh, was a partner on this project. And so I got a chance to travel there and understand what they were doing. And I think it's one of the best examples of a collaboration of people um, to make a river healthier uh, that you can find. And so it's a, it's a great little story, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. This river is really important for uh, bird, migratory birds in the, in the desert southwest, of course, for fish that live in the river, um, other uh, animals, because in the desert, a river is really the only source of water. So it's a critical lifeline for virtually all the living things in the southwest. But it's in an agricultural valley. 
And so the, over the last you know, century and a half, the farmers have been taking virtually all of this water during the irrigation season and putting it into a ditch system, which then carries that water to their farms. And so there were times where there was no water, virtually no water, in this river for five, six, seven, eight miles, right? And not good for fish and birds that, that depend on that water. And it's a very important river for biodiversity. And so about 10 years ago or so, um, a hydrologist named Kim Shonick with the Nature Conservancy, she was in Oregon, she moved to the valley, and she was given the task of trying to protect the biodiversity in the Verde River. And she knew that she had a tough road to go because irrigators have a lot of water rights you know, to, to, the, to the river, and they would be suspicious, right, if somebody new coming into town and saying, you know, we're going to do something different, suspicious that the Nature Conservancy was there to take their water and, and keep it in the river and take it away from them. And so she spent a lot of time, you know, talking with the farmers and the irrigators and building trust with them. Very, very important to do. And so they started to enjoy each other, work together, and come up with some very creative solutions that wouldn't have happened if they didn't come together and collaborate. And one of the things they did that was, that was really creative was go onto the ditch system and put in this automated head gate on the ditch. This is a, a gentleman named Frank Gaminden. He was what, what's called the ditch boss. He controlled the water distribution throughout the ditch. And this is a solar powered gate that allows the irrigators, the farmers, to take just the water they need and leave the rest for the river. It's not rocket science, but it needed to be done if there was going to be a solution to meeting the farmer's needs for water, but making the river healthier again. And so this, uh, this collaboration resulted in uh, this upgrade to the irrigation system that kept water flowing in the river. And so the Verde River now has, in, in, in places, now has twice as much flow in the summertime, that irrigation season, as it did before. And so really great example. You have a young farmer like Zach Hauser who's gotten on board and switched from flood irrigation, literally flooding the field, um, to installing drip irrigation, which is the most efficient way we know of to irrigate, where you deliver just the right amount of water to the roots of the plant and not more. And so you're, allowed, you're able then to keep more water in the river because you need less to irrigate the field. So another way that the Verde River got more water, but the irrigator, Zach in this case, got the amount that he needed. So nobody was losing, everybody was winning. And this was really uh, the outcome, that you had the farmers got a more modern irrigation system, the birds and wildlife got better habitat because the river was healthier, and the community was able to have more recreation. They could go boating, they could go birding, they could go fishing, and there would be a healthy river there to be on. So it was good for everybody, and it only took getting smarter, a bit of technology, a collaboration to get it installed, and then make sure that everyone uh, is, is getting their needs met. And it's been a great example. And other creative ideas in the valley have come about too since, uh, since this. So it's, it's a great example of, of kind of a triple win. Um, and it's all about getting smarter, right, about how we, we use and manage water. Here's a question we can all think about. You know, what can cities and towns do to help repair the water cycle? If you think about it, um, cities and towns don't use as much water as agriculture, much, much less, but they need that water in a very concentrated place. So again, very important to conserve water. So think about, it just again, this is in the United States, our domestic water use, our household water use per person is down by 18%. That's really terrific, right? We have done a great job of conserving, and that was largely because we have laws that require that the makers of shower heads and faucets and toilets meet certain standards of efficiency. When I was a kid, it took about 
six gallons of water to flush a toilet. Now it cannot take more than 1.6. So just flushing the toilet takes a whole lot less water now than it did when I was a kid. And so that has saved a lot of water. If you add up all these savings in our homes and in our offices, it adds up to about 7 billion, that's with a B, billion, 7 billion gallons of water a day that we're saving through conservation, more efficient. To the toilets, faucets, shower heads, washing machines, dishwashers, all this has made a difference. And we're, we're using a whole lot less water. Here's a picture of the water use in Boston, if anybody's um, on, on from the East Coast. Today, water use in Boston is about the same as it was 50 years ago. Even though Boston has, has had a very growing economy through conservation, they're not using any more water than they were 50 years ago. And you can cite a num number of other cities uh, that are 50 years ago. And you can cite a num number of other cities uh, that are similarly having great benefits from, from conservation. Especially in the Western United States, the big new challenge is outdoors. You know, we still have a lot of green lawns out, outdoors in the West where people irrigate to keep that lawn green. And, and yet we know that planting uh, drought tolerant plants, native plants that require little irrigation can save a whole lot of water in your, in your home, home area. So that's one area that um, cities are paying a lot of attention to now, trying to motivate people to, to plant native plants instead of, instead of thirsty grass. We also have this thing called green infrastructure. I don't know if any of you have heard that term, but it basically refers to ways we can get rainfall to do what it used to do before we had the city there. If you think about what was there before the city, it was wood, you know, forests and woodlands and wetlands and floodplains and um, lakes, areas where the rain would fall and just infiltrate the earth. But now there's concrete, there's imper impermeable pavement, there's streets and driveways and schools. And so the, the rain falls, it has nowhere to go. And the idea behind green infrastructure is to create spaces where that rain can once again infiltrate the earth and replenish the soil and replenish the groundwater. So if you look at the picture on the right, for example, that's something we call a bioswale or a vegetated swale, where the rain runs into that depression and instead of running onto the street, sits in that depression and recharges the ground and goes into the groundwater. So you're taking stormwater and making it an, you know, a benefit, an asset, rather than a flooding nuisance, right? We have rain garden picture there on the left. We have now the idea of permeable pavement. So instead of a pavement where the water runs off, you have a pavement where the water soaks in. China has one of the biggest programs in this now, and they call it their sponge city program. The president of China got up and said, we want China's cities to work more like sponges, capturing water, holding water, and allowing it to, to infiltrate. And so they have a big program going on in I think now 30 cities in China trying to build these kinds of structures to capture and store water to deal with floods and deal with droughts and everything in between. So it's a great, it's a great example. In this country, we have Philadelphia with a big program. Portland, Oregon, I think is doing a lot. A um, number of cities and more and more are looking to this as ways to to really sort of repair that, that urban water cycle. So let me move on to one other interesting um, example. <clears throat> I'll go through this one pretty quickly. We've heard a lot about fire, wildfire, in the last few years. It seems like we're having wildfires break out more and more, again, particularly in the west, um, but in the southeast part of the country also. Um, and, and it's partly because of increased temperatures and increased drought, and partly because of the way we've managed forests in the past. You know, when a fire would break out, we would tend to put it out as quickly as possible, rather than letting it burn a bit, because of course we had houses there and people there, we didn't want the fire to spread. 
But from nature's point of view, fire is important to the ecosystem. There are some trees that need fire to regenerate. And fire also cleans out the underbrush. You don't want too much underbrush because that's just fuel for the fire. And so as a result of putting out all these fires and not letting sort of natural fires happen, we've, we've ended up with a lot of extra fuel in our forested watersheds, fuel that can burn. So we now have twice as much area burning as a result of wildfires each year as we did um, a few decades back. So this is a, a growing problem. And it's also a problem to water quality. This is the first day, the picture you're looking at is the first day of a fire called the Las Conchas, which was a fire that broke out in New Mexico, which is the state I'm living in now, in 2011. And this fire burned one acre per, excuse me, this fire burned 14 acres per second. No, I'm sorry, let me get the statistic right. This fire burned one acre per second for the first 14 hours. That's it. One acre every second for the first 14 hours that it burned. So it was burning really hot and really fast. And here's what it looked, this uh, area of the Hamas Mountains looked like after the burn. Ultimately, when the fire was brought under control in early August, the fire broke out in June, brought under control in early August, it had burned 156,000 acres. And it looked like this, OK? This was. Um, this is not a river. This is a canyon. So the floodwaters, when the rains came in, in New Mexico, we have a season called the monsoon season because you get these really torrential rains in the summertime. And it brought all of the dead logs, the blackened logs, and the, the sediment and everything through the canyon and out toward the river itself, toward the Rio Grande. And you can see this plug of sediment coming in from the left-hand side of the picture into the Rio Grande. So for the Albuquerque water utility downstream, this was a problem. We don't want all of that sediment going through the water treatment plant and gunking it up and so on. So they had to shut down the water intake and pump more groundwater to supply all the residents of Albuquerque. So it was a big deal. And if they hadn't had that groundwater to turn to, they would have had a real problem, potentially. Here's what Cochiti Lake looked like with all the logs and everything. So it was just a mess. and so. You know, you could have sort of crossed your fingers and said, well, hopefully we'll clean this up and hopefully it won't happen again. But with climate change, we know it's going to happen again, right? And so the story here is that conservation groups, the Nature Conservancy being the leader in this case, got together and started something called the Rio Grande Water Fund. And they build it as a way to protect against wildfire and protect water quality. They launched it a couple of years after that big Los Conchas fire. They launched it in 2014. And the goal is to bring you know, conservation groups, the communities, uh, federal agencies, state agencies, forestry agencies all together to rehabilitate 600,000 acres of forest over the next 20 years. And that's to become more resilient to fire. And the early signs are that in those areas where they do the thinning of the forest, where they do a managed prescribed burn, a controlled burn, so that you can clear out that underbrush, that a fire is less likely to get out of control and, and it result in a big mega fire when it does occur. So the evidence seems to be that it's, it's working. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of work and it takes a great collaboration. But it's another example of working together, right? in order to make the water cycle, the watersheds function better and to, and to, and to function as they did um, uh, when nature was more in control of things, if you will. So another great example. Um, I'm going to flip through these really quick. My goal was to stop after about 20 minutes and open it up for questions. And I'm just going to give you one more really quick example that's one of my favorites, because it's an example of two countries working together to make a river healthier. And this, in this case, we're talking about the United States and Mexico. Back in 2012, we had a serious drought going on um, in the southwestern part of the country. It's frankly still going on. We're almost in 20 years of drought in, in the Colorado River Basin. But a decision was made thanks to a really hard 
20 years of work by conservation organizations on both sides of the border, um, both governments working together, they decided that among other things, they were going to give some water back to the river. And they were gonna try to sort of mimic the way nature makes a river flow in the West in the, in the springtime. When the snow melts, the river gets a pulse of water and it flows down through the system, through the Delta and out to the sea. And so the idea was to try to mimic that. And the idea that in a time of drought, two countries would come together to give a river back some water is pretty extraordinary anyway. But it also was a really extraordinary scientific experiment. And it showed that if we put our minds to this, we can, in fact, restore a river. So let me just show you a few examples of a few photos of what happened. This is the very last dam on the Colorado River. It's right near the border of the US and Mexico. It's called the Morales Dam. And on a Sunday morning in March of, 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 of 2012, 2014, excuse me, those gates came up and the Colorado River water came through. It was the first time the delta of the Colorado had seen water in a very long time. Typically, all of the water gets siphoned off right at that dam to supply Mexico's needs. Remember, the United States gets 90% of the Colorado River. Mexico gets 10%. So Mexico uses all of its water, just as we use all of ours, to grow crops and to supply cities. Nothing left for the river. So on this day, the gates went up and water comes through for, um, for the river. Within a few days, this is what the upper part of that river looked like. It was flowing big like a river should. That's me in the canoe in the front and the gentleman in the back, uh, not behind me, but in the canoe behind, behind me with the hat on, he's an ecologist um, at the time working with Pronatura, a Mexican conservation organization, and he's amazing. He can identify 350 birds just by the sound that they make. And in those couple hours we were canoeing on the river, he identified more than 40 birds that had already sensed the return of the river and were coming to the floodplain, to the uh, habitat along the river, and to the river itself. It was amazing. Uh, he could name them. We saw some of them. We heard most of them. And what the life was already coming back. It was extraordinary. We would go out every morning and try to find the leading edge of the river. It took weeks for the river to flow from that dam that I showed you all the way to the sea. This was the leading edge of the river. This, this area was going to fill with water over the course of the next couple of days. But we would try to kind of track the river. Where is it going to be today? That's me in the blue shirt taking notes because I wrote about this for my book. And then what we were so surprised about was how the community was so excited to have the river come back. These kids that you see were living in a town, are living in a town called San Luis, Rio Colorado, and they had never seen the river that had given their own town its name. So people came out in droves, you know, with, with music and dogs and picnics and just had a fabulous time playing in the river, canoeing in the river, swimming in the river, because they hadn't had their river in a really long time. And it was like a big celebration a welcoming home of the river. It took about eight weeks, but the river eventually did reach the sea. The sea in this case is the Gulf of California in Mexico called the Sea of Cortez. And it was an extraordinary sight. It was not a lot of water from the point of view of the ecosystem, but it was symbolic, right? That if we put our minds to it, we could actually make, make this happen. And now the work of restoration is going on in the Delta taking some of that irrigation water and providing it to grow habitats so that birds and wildlife might once again have habitats in the delta. So these are cottonwood trees, willow trees, mesquite trees that conservation groups are planting and that volunteer, voluntary irrigation water is being used to, to help them to grow. So you create, create kind of these stepping stones of habitat where particularly birds can can use to nest and rest and feed and grow as they travel from South America all the way up to the Arctic, right, on the Pacific Flyway. Again, this whole area used to be a huge wetland, 
we're just try trying to recreate some little pockets of wetlands so that some of the some of the ecosystem comes back. So that's really the story. And I want to leave you before we go into your questions with, with this big message. And this is the most important thing uh, for today is that by working together and working with nature, right, we can build a more secure and better water future. It's really up to us. And that's what I learned from all the stories I researched, and all the projects I was part of over the last you know, bunch of years. Um, but we need to scale this up, right? Problems are happening kind of fast. Climate change is upon us. We sort of need to get on with it. And so we have these, these examples as touchstones of what we can do. And now we need to scale that up, do more of it, and move these examples out into the world. So thank you for listening. You've been super patient. Um, do you have questions? If you do, um, let's take a look at them here, OK? I see some of you had some guesses on the shirts. OK, here we go. Um, that's an interesting question. Can animals disrupt the water cycle? Well, certainly we have disrupted the water cycle. I think you've made that clear. So we're an animal, um, and I would say we have disrupted the water cycle. Most animals in nature, um, I would say, are, you know, are part of a natural system and help, generally speaking, help the water cycle function. So from insects to fish to birds to mammals, they all play a part in how an ecosystem functions, in the food web and the recycling of nutrients. So generally speaking, animals are part of the natural cycle and help to make it function. Because of our ability to engineer um, changes in the water cycle, we've been more disruptive. You know, rivers no longer flow naturally because of dams. And we have these big, big pumps that can take groundwater out of the deep earth. We have um, the ability to just take river water out and move it hundreds of miles to a new place. Um, you know, Los Angeles gets water from hundreds of miles away from the Colorado River. So I think it's more than us, to be honest, um, that's disrupted the water cycle. But again, we can fix it and we can become part of that water cycle, you know, again. Can cities recycle water? Absolutely. And I'm glad, Kathy, you brought that up um, because that's one of the ways cities are becoming more efficient. Um, if you think about, we have this word called wastewater, right? Um, but in fact, we can take the waste out of wastewater and make it useful again. If you, if you use water in your home, it goes into you know, your sewer system, say it goes to a wastewater treatment plant, it gets treated there. And depending on how well it's treated, it can be used again, maybe to water a garden, water um, a park. And so you can use that water again. And so water recycling and water reuse are becoming a really important feature of, of water conservation and, and meeting our water needs in cities. I live not too far from Albuquerque, and water recycling and water reuse are a big way that Albuquerque is planning to meet water needs for the next century. So it's very, very important. Yes, thank you for that question. What websites and books do you recommend for further study? I think I skipped a couple. Let's go back. Um, what interested you in your life to research water? Oh boy, you know I grew up um, I grew up on Long Island in New York, and my family loved the beach, and so you almost think I would have gotten into ocean conservation. But um, and I love the ocean. I still love the ocean. But I grew up around water. And then when I got um, to college, I studied geology. I wasn't planning on studying geology. I, I was really interested in studying history and philosophy. But I somehow, when I was taking a basic science course in geology, I just fell in love with it. And that sort of got me interested in water. And I went to grad school at Duke University. Um, and I studied environmental management there. I studied wetlands and, hy and hydrology and a lot of ecology. Um, and then my first job was with a small company in California, and I just happened to get placed on the freshwater projects. 
Um, one of them was a freshwater conservation project in Tucson, Arizona. Um, another, so anyway, another, another dealt with groundwater. So I think it was partly my interest. I had known since I was a teenager um, that I wanted to do something with my life that would benefit the earth. I had a very strong, I don't know, calling maybe, I guess, to do something on behalf of the earth. And I had that since I was 15, but it probably took till I was in graduate school to figure out what I was really going to do to make that happen. And once I saw the issues with fresh water, the challenges, fell in love with rivers, that was sort of it. I just stuck with that. And it's it's been really fun and really super rewarding for me. Um, so I've been very lucky, I guess, to find that purpose and feel like I, I could make a difference, hopefully. and and have a good time studying at the same time. So thank you for that question. Let's see. Um, do you think, I'm going to skip what is your next book because I don't know. I don't know what it is yet. I'm working on it. Um, do you think the melting of the glaciers will increase the availability of fresh water in the future? Thank you. That is a really good and complicated question. So. Think about all of the water that's stored in, in ice, in glaciers, in the Himalayas, for example. <clears throat> during parts of the year, right, during the warmer months, those glaciers melt a bit, and they lead to rivers, which then go down gradient to farmers and cities downstream for their irrigation water, for their drinking water. But if those glaciers are melting faster, which they are because of climate change, warming temperature is leading to faster melting, for a while there's going to be more water, maybe even flooding, right? You're going to have a faster melting of that ice. So you're going to have an increased supply for a while. But then when the glaciers are no more, you're not going to have that water supply because those rivers depended on the melting of the glacier. And so we're very concerned about this because there are now about 2 billion people just downstream from the glaciers in the Himalayas, the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayas, in China, India, Pakistan, that area of the world in Asia. 2 billion people that depend on rivers that emerge from those glaciers. They depend on them for food and for drinking water. So what happens when those glaciers are gone? And the evidence suggests that those glaciers are melting faster than we thought. So this is a very big problem. You can't just up and move 2 billion people, right? And so it's, it's something that uh, scientists and, and you know, development experts are thinking a lot about. It's a, it's a big concern. So that's a great question. We're, we're going to have to adjust our, our, our systems, really, our societies to that, to that situation. Let's see, is there any other, let me see, how much water does it take to produce one pound of beef? Wow. So this is a good question, too. Now, I'm going to talk, let's see, a pound of beef. If it's OK, I'm going to talk about a hamburger, OK? Like a quarter pounder, say. Um, and the average amount of water that it takes to produce a burger, so this is the typical commercial beef, right, is about 630 gallons to make one burger. So not that different from the cotton shirt. They're kind of about the same. But I write about this in my latest book, um, which I showed a picture of, Replenish. I have a whole section on meat um, and talk about how it's not the cows themselves so much that leads to a burger taking that much water. It's how we manage the cows. And what we have seen and what we have found and what the scientists are finding and what ranchers are finding is that if you can manage cows in a way similar to the way bison naturally used to roam the range, staying in a herd, staying together, and moving regularly. So ranchers that are practicing this technique, which is called managed grazing, managed intensive grazing, which means that instead of the cows being everywhere, eating out freely on the range, whatever they want, wherever they want, roaming around, you manage them. And you have them in a paddock, and you keep them there for as long as it takes for them to eat but not overeat, 
the grass that's in that area. And then you move them. And so you have fencing and you move them from one place to another. So it's much more intensive work than just letting them out on the open range. But if you do that, the evidence suggests that you're actually improving the health of the soil, which means you're going to store more water in the soil, which means you're going to have better grassland habitat for birds. And so I have a story about a ranch here in New Mexico that is working with the National Audubon Society, which is worried about the decline in grassland bird populations. And they're working with private ranches to produce beef in this ecologically good way. And a burger that's produced from cows raised like that takes way less water, a, a fraction of the, the same amount of water as that commercial burger did. So when I eat beef, I try very hard to eat beef that's made from cows raised in this way so that it's contributing to a healthier environment and not and not degrading the environment and using so much water. I hope that I hope that makes sense. It's a complicated picture because if you think about it, you know, the cow is um, when the, the, the manure from the cow is fertilizing the soil, the cows kind of stomp that manure into the soil, which in, it fertilizes it, adds organic matter to it, which allows that soil to store more water. The more carbon in the soil, the more water the soil can hold. And that's where you get the benefit. And then you have more grasses, more diversity of grasses. So again, it's an example of working with nature, mimicking the way natural bison, you know, we're on the range, but growing our meat in that way. Now, we probably couldn't eat as much meat as a society as we do now and grow it in this sustainable way. We could eat some, not as much, not a lot. But think of it as you know, more of a luxury than an everyday thing if, if we wanted to do that. And I'm, I'm very careful not to get preachy about diet. I think diet is a very personal thing. Um, some people, I think, you know, need different things than others in terms of diet. So it's not about getting preachy about it, but just understanding what it takes to make different things and being able to make choices that feel that feel good to us. Okay, let's see. Oh, we only have three minutes. Um, okay, you're passing to the next class. How long do you think it will take until the broken water cycle catches up to us, takes full effect? Yes. How long do you think it will take until the broken water cycle catches up to us, takes full effect? Um, I'm going to, you're all leaving, but I'm going to say that I think, you know, we have some great examples to build on, so let's work together and do it. Okay, thank you so much for joining today. Think about fresh water and uh, wish you all the best in your studies and in your, and in your lives, okay? Thank you so much.